Welcome to Revelation Bible Study, hosted, streamed by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School here in Boca Raton, Florida. I am the instructor here, teacher, host, whatever you want to call me, Josh Laborious, and this is the video for Revelation 11. Shameless plug for the day, if you want to see the rest of the videos of all the different chapters of Revelation, go ahead to St. Paul's channel, and there's a playlist there called Revelation Bible Study, and it goes through one through 22. This is actually the video in the middle because we started when the stay-at-home orders were issued. We started doing this video Bible study in chapter 12 and once I got to 22 I started backfilling and doing 1, 2, 3 because I had taught all those in person but then I had some people say we were watching the videos now but we weren't able to go in person. We'd like the rest. So this is the last one. This is the one that connects the, the backfilling to where we started with the video study. So this is chapter 11, and that playlist has all the chapters for you. Um, I would encourage you also just subscribe to St. Paul's YouTube page because they have this Bible study, they have other Bible studies. Going forward, it's looking like most of the Bible studies are going to be hybrid. So even if they're in person, they're also going to be recorded and put online, which is awesome. There are daily devotions with Pastor Steve. There are, there are live worship services and all sorts of other stuff. So subscribe to the page. That's right below your screen. Um, those are my shameless plugs for this session. With that, we're going to step toward Revelation 11. Not quite into it yet because I want us to remember where we're coming from. And if you just finished the previous video, then obviously you know where we're coming from. And yes, this is the, th the same shirt because I'm recording two videos on the same day. Focus. Um, but if we go all the way back to chapter 9, that was the fifth and the sixth trumpet. And we're looking at these demonic attacks. And then in chapter 10, there's an intermission between the fifth and sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. And here in chapter 11, there's a little more of that intermission, and then we get to the seventh trumpet. So that's kind of where we're coming from and where we're going. So with that, we're going to step into this text. I'd encourage you, as I always do, get your handy-dandy Bible, whether it looks like this or whether it looks like this or whether it looks like one of those on the shelf that look a lot nicer than this because they're not covered in duct tape. Whatever it looks like, get your Bible out, turn to chapter 11 of Revelation. It is toward the end of your Bible. See, toward the end. Um, and we're going to just start with the first three verses. It says, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for forty-two months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. So, rise and measure the, the temple of God. Um, first of all, the temple of God refers symbolically to God's people. It's not necessarily a literal physical building. And is in Ezekiel, the measuring of the temple, because this happens in the past, the measuring of the temple in a vision is part of God's promise that it will be rebuilt. In Zechariah, the, the measurement of the temple is a promise of protection for God's people. So we have kind of that background going when he says measure the temple, measure God's people. But then there's this instruction that says, do not measure the court outside the temple. Do not measure what is symbolically the realm of unbelievers. And then it says they will trample the holy city. So this is talking about the fate of Jerusalem. When, when the Bible talks about the holy city, an overwhelming amount of the time, it's talking about Jerusalem. And for to take this opportunity, I want to do a little bit of a tangent on something we call the two realms of prophecy. There is the near realm, and that is where we look at history. We look at Old Testament prophecies, and then we look at the history of the world that has happened since then, and we say, well, this, this prophecy was pointing toward this event in history. So, you know, one of the prophets says this city is going to fall, and then 200 years later the city falls, and we're here a few hundred years beyond that, and we say we can see that that happened. Um, and that's the near realm of prophecy. And then the far realm of prophecy is the are prophecies that are not yet fulfilled. Um, 
like these. Many prophecies are both or can be both, and that's especially true of messianic prophecies. Because a lot Jesus fulfilled a lot of them when he came, and a lot of them have yet to be fulfilled because he's coming again to um, finish his work. And Isaiah all over the place, you see this both and. So I bring that up to say that this, these 1,260 days, these 42 months, that is the length of time that Antiochus Epiphanes terrorized Jerusalem. Um, this is symbolic of persecution, of testing. This number comes up a few more times. And this way of measuring time, this, this way of describing time, it connects to the passage to the way Daniel would frequently describe time. So that's the 42 months. And then we see, I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. Um, the law of Moses, Old Testament law, required two witnesses to co corroborate one another. You couldn't bring a charge or an accusation or something forward just on the testimony of one witness. You needed two. Um, so what we have here are prophets, these two witnesses, these are prophets preaching repentance, which again is the whole point of the entire book of Revelation. The whole book point of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins, um, the repentance, the turning away from sin and brokenness. Um, which is even more because they're clothed in sackcloth, which is significant of repentance, of humble sacrificial service, of penitence. Um, so that's kind of what we have in the imagery of those two witnesses. And with that, we're going to step into the next three verses, Revelation chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. It says, There, there are the two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So these two olive trees that this passage starts with, they're reflective of Zechariah. These are two anointed servants of Yahweh. They are for the purposes of edifying and nourishing the church. They are oil for the lamps, which we see the lampstands here. That is, lampstands are symbolic of the New Testament church, of the church that we are still a part of today. We are lamps, and the church is a lampstand. The lamp stand lifts up the lamp so the lamp can shine the light, the light of the gospel into the world. Um, so you have these connections here. Fire pours from their mouth. Fire as evidence of God's work in the world. Uh, again, this is a connection back to Elijah calling down fire. The word, of, uh, the word of God is a consuming word. That's kind of the connection we see here. And when it talks about these, these prophets, these servants, they have all the power of the prophets of old. And all of this drives toward repentance. And we see that again and again. God, when he unleashes these things, when he unleashes the drought on Ahab, when he unleashes the plagues on Egypt, it's driving them toward repentance. All of this with God as the source. So let's be clear here. These two prophets don't have these powers on their own. This is the power of God being worked through them. Um, so that's what we have in those three verses. And then we're going to step into verses 7 through verse 10. It says, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some people from the, some from the peoples and the tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because those two prophets had been a torment to those who had dwelled on the earth. Um, so there's this reality that when God's church is in mission, when God's church is doing its job, the enemy is furious. We see this beast that is the angel of the abyss, that is the devil, is furious. 
And he successfully kills these prophets. And the, the church is trodden underfoot. And what we see here is that when the church is trodden underfoot, all that is left is evil. And this makes sense because without the church, there are no faithful people. And you may say, well, what if someone has faith and they're not part of a church? Well, I'm talking about the church, the invisible church. That includes everyone who has faith in God, but isn't part of a church. But I'm also going to stop you there. Because if you have faith in God, and you are able to go to a church. So if you live in America, you have the ability to go to church. Right now that may be virtually, but you have the ability to connect with the body of believers. And you are called to do so. Not going to church because you don't agree with institutionalized religion is sinful. We are called to be in community with and in support with our brothers and sisters. The only excuse for not being in a church and having faith in God and being part of the invisible church but not the visible church, the only real excuse for that is if you're in a place where you literally cannot go to church. If, if you were a believer in, in uh, a country where churches were not there, or if you were out in the wilderness and you, there was no access to a body of believers for you to join with, that's the only excuse you got. That's a tangent. Sorry. Going back. Um, so for three and a half days, people are celebrating the remo removal of the church. You see, people like the illusion of freedom. Because the church does come with demands. It says this is how we're, we're called to act. This is what we ought to be doing. And does the church always do that perfectly? No, that's what forgiveness is all about. That's why Jesus Christ came in the first place. We're not called, or we are called to be perfect, but God realizes we can't do that. But people like the illusion of being able to do whatever they want. They still haunt those who killed them, though. The, these remnants of the church, they're still in the road. They're, <laughs> the people who are celebrating, their lives are still about what the church was doing in their lives. Even if it's not the appropriate response, it, it's... So what are some instances where even we rejoice at the church being inactive? And I, I want to ask this question to you because if you're watching this video, you are probably a Christian. So when we aren't doing our job, when we aren't in mission, when we aren't proclaiming the word of God, what are some ways that maybe even we rejoice at that? Instances where we put God's word aside. Um, and I'm not going to get into that. I want you to just reflect on that. But anyway, we're going to step into these next five verses, uh, four verses of Revelation, uh, starting at verse 11 in chapter 11. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. They stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. They heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand were, people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified, and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. So what we're seeing here is we see resurrection of Christians at the end. And God's power does this because God can raise the dead. And if we're connecting these people to the church, um, a, a lot of people have liked to say, well, churches have a life cycle. They're born, they grow, they, they then shrink and die. And that's not a perfect analogy. That's a pattern that we see, but it, it's not concrete. It's not mandatory. The church, if you have a church that's growing, it doesn't eventually have to stop growing and die. It can just keep growing. That's the incredible gift of the gospel. Um, but frequently this is used as an excuse for complacency. People see a church declining. People within a church see that they're declining and they say, this is just the life cycle of the church. Because they don't want to have to change to reach the community around them, to reach out with the gospel. There is never a point where Christ cannot raise up his church and bring more people to kneel before his throne. So they went up to heaven. 
Their final end on earth is resurrection. No matter how grim it looks, God can bring his people to himself. And then at the that hour, we see these, the great earthquake. We see the city fall. And throughout the Bible, earthquakes frequently accompany God's mighty acts. And then what we see is incredible. We see a shift in hardened unbelievers. These people were celebrating at the death of the church. And it says that they were then at the end, they were terrified and giving glory to God in heaven. This might be an indication of a turn to repentance. So there's this reality that no matter how far you think you have strayed from God, pray for mercy because even if it seems hopeless, God can do incredible things in your life and in the life of people around you. If you know someone who is hardened unbeliever, they will have nothing to do with Christ. Do not give up on them. Pray for them because God can work in their hearts, in their minds, and in their lives. So, and then it says the second woe is past. The third woe is closely on the heels of this second one. And that's what we're going to step into in verse 15 through 19. It says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. This is the last trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord, of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. So there are these loud voices that we see here. They're continuing in the hymn of praise that started all the way back in chapter 4. And this is following so many mighty acts of God's judgment. But what I, what I want to say here is the voices are not identified, but later they're connected to an immense crowd in heaven. So keep watching through those videos and you'll get into a deeper explanation of that. But then it talks about the kingdom of the world. That had all, which is representative, it's language to say that which had rebelled against God, the sinful, the broken, it's now God's again. And again, this is all about the redemptive work of Christ in creation. God is bringing the world back to himself. It's only briefly given over to the prince of darkness. And then we see this, they're giving, the saints are giving thanks to God for his judgment, for God in his full supremacy, removing rebellion and uncleanness from creation. And then we see God's temple, the ultimate sign of victory. This is the end. This is the pinnacle of new creation. We're seeing here an ultimate display of God's power. A majestic, loud amen. And that's what we see in verses 18 and 19. The nations raged, but your wrath came. The time for the dead to be judged, the rewarding of your saints, the prophets and saints, and those who fear, you, fear your name, both small and great, for destroying the destroyers of the earth. God is finishing his work. Then his temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were lightning and rumblings of thunder, peals of thunder, and earthquake and heavy hail. So we see all of creation celebrating God, bringing the world back to himself, and that is is where Revelation 11 ends, to be continued in Revelation 12 through 22, as I said. So I hope this was helpful to you. Again, subscribe to St. Paul. Uh, there should be a link over my shoulder to Revelation 12 if you just want to keep stepping through the videos. But with that, this is actually my last Bible study recording at St. Paul. So brothers and sisters, one last time, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.